biology. So apart from that, now getting to know the structure of the kidney, how the kidney looks like. So let's now enter into the kidney and look at now these structures which are referred to as the nephrons. So what are the nephrons? So nephrons basically, uh, we see that these are the basic functional units of a kidney. That is the definition of a nephron. It's the basic functional unit of a kidney. Whereby we see that since we have two kidneys, each kidney has approximately 1.25 million nephrons. So each kidney, 1.25 million, 1.25 million. So they are very tiny, they are microscopic, and they are very many. So those are the nephrons. This is the nephron, the basic unit of the kidney. So it is here in this nephron whereby ultrafiltration takes place. Waste products from the blood are removed and taken to, uh, to form urine and then essential products are let to circulate into the body. So it is this place also whereby water reabsorption takes place. Excess water will be removed through the collecting duct, distal convoluted, and then to form the pelvis to form urine. This is a very tiny microscopic structure and for the definition, remember we say that it is the basic functional unit of every kidney, whereby in each kidney, there are about 1.25 million nephrons inside. So for these nephrons, we see that it is mainly divided into two parts. So the first part of the nephron is referred to as the renal tube, which mainly comprises of the Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tube, the loop of phenol, the distal convoluted tube, etc. So it comprises of the renal tube and then as well as glomerulus. Those are the main parts of the nephron. So the renal tubes and the glomerulus. As you can see, the glomerulus is found inside the Bowman's capsule. So glomerulus simply, these are very many blood capillaries. So these are densely, this is a dense pack of blood capillaries. So they are found inside now the Bowman's capsule. That is the glomerulus. So in here, the glomerulus, this is the place where ultrafiltration process takes place. After that, we go now to the proximal convoluted tube. So in the proximal convoluted tube, also we have different reabsorption of substances into the blood, including different mineral ions that you're going to look at. Then after that, we go to the loop of phenol. So in the loop of phenol, water reabsorption takes place. For desert organisms, they have a very long loop of phenol for maximum reabsorption of water. For aquatic organisms, they have a very short loop of phenol so that maximum water will not be reabsorbed. Why? Because water is readily available in the surrounding. So after loop of phenol, we go to the distal convoluted tube whereby also here there's, re, there is reabsorption of water through antidiuretic anti hormone produced by the pituitary gland. Then the collecting duct, which forms the pelvis at the end of the line. So now since now we know the structure of the nephron, so now let's look at the mechanism of excretion. So how does excretion basically take place in this uh, nephron? So how does excretion take place? Remember we have blood. How is it that these things are filtered out of the blood? And then the essential things like blood cells are let to pass. That is all about excretion, and uh, no, mechanism of excretion through the nephron. So you see that through the nephron, excretion takes place in three basic steps. So the first step is filtration. The second step is selective reabsorption, whereby different substances will be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. Apart from selective reabsorption, lastly we have removal of waste products. Now, through the collecting duct, that is where now the removal of waste products will be removed. Selective reabsorption, uh, no, filtration is going to take place in the Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus. Selective reabsorption, this reabsorption is going to take place in the, uh, in the different tubules that we have that you are going to see. So let's begin with the first one, which is filtration or ultra-filtration. So for this filtration process, we basically see that the kidneys receive blood from a branch of the artery. Rather, they receive blood from the renal artery, which is the branch of the aorta. So that is where the blood vessels, whereby the kidney receives blood. So they receive blood from the renal artery, which is the branch of the aorta. 
So you see that this blood from the heart or this blood from the renal artery is rich in nitrogenous waste, it is rich in excess water, it is rich in excess mineral ions, and also it is rich in nitrogenous waste, yes, like urea. So it has very many waste products as well as having oxygen, which is good. So it has very many waste products. So simply blood here contains dissolved substances like uh, plasma proteins, it has dissolved substances like hormones, and yes, it is from the heart, it has dissolved oxygen gas. So that is the blood from the renal artery, which now enters into the kidney. So apart from that, we see that blood flows in capillaries under, under very high pressure due to the narrowness of the capillary. So remember, the outer is very large, it has a high pressure. Renal artery, which is now the branch of the outer, yes, it, is, it still has very high pressure, and then it forms now the afferent arterial. So the outer is large, renal artery is larger. No, the outer is larger, renal artery is large, then we have the afferent arterial. So the afferent arterial now enters into the glomerulus. Remember I said that glomerulus, the glomerulus is, is a composition of very many blood capillaries. Not now the arterial, but capillaries. So the blood enters into the kidney through the renal artery. The renal artery branches now to form the afferent arteriole, which now enters into the glomerulus. And then it exits the glomerulus as the efferent arteriole, as you can see. Afferent enters, and then, mind you, afferent is much wider. Efferent is narrower. So it means that the blood entering enters at a very high pressure, then as it leaves, it is very, uh, it leaves in a very narrow efferent arterial pipe. So why is it that the afferent which brings in blood, it is very wide. Efferent removing blood is very narrow. So the reason why afferent arterial is wider than the efferent arterial is to create a high pressure in the glomerulus for maximum filtration of substances into the bloodstream so that the filtered substances uh, the filtered waste products are going to leave the glomerulus and enter into the renal tubes as now the essential products will be forced to pass through the small efferent arterial and back into the bloodstream. So due to this we see that a very high pressure gradient is going to be created. It's going to be created in the glomerulus. So this high pressure, grad, uh, high pressure gradient is going to force water some mineral ions and urea to pass through the glomerulus and into the Bowman's capsule. So some of these substances are like urea, we have said we have uric acid, we said we have glucose. These are substances which, which are going to pass through and enter into the, like into the renal tubes. So they are going to leave the glomerulus and into the renal tubes. So we have urea, we have uric acid, we have glucose, we have mineral salts, we have some amino acids, and did I say water molecules? And also water molecules. So they are going to be forced into, uh, from the glomerulus and into the Bowman's capsule. So we see that large-sized um, protein molecules or large-sized molecules, for example, proteins and red blood cells are not going to be filtered because, first of all, they are large. So it is impossible for them to pass through the small holes of the glomerulus. So the large-sized uh, molecules, like for example proteins, the red blood cells, are not going to be filtered out through the glomerulus. Why? Because they are large and they are unable to pass through the small holes of the, of the glomerulus and into the Bowman's capsule. So this process of filtration, uh, whereby materials are removed out of the glomerulus, and into the Bowman's capsule. So this process of filtration is referred to as ultrafiltration or pressure filtration. So this filtrate, now this filtrate that is coming out of the glomerulus and into the Bowman's capsule. So this filtrate is referred to as the glomerular filtrate. That fluid which is coming now from the glomerulus and into the Bowman's capsule is referred to as the glomerular filtrate. That is the name given to that filtrate, glomerular filtrate. So now apart from that, let's go to the next subtopic, uh, which is now selective reabsorption. 
So in the proximal convoluted tube, so remember, we are from the Bowman's capsule, we are now in the proximal convoluted tube. So for the selective reabsorption, we see that as the filtrate flows through the renal tubes, some of the useful substances will be selectively reabsorbed back into the bloodstream in the proximal convoluted tube. Because as you can see, if you can look at the proximal convoluted tube, you can be able to realize that it is densely packed with blood vessels. So very many blood capillaries are passing through the proximal convoluted tube. So the reason as to why these blood vessels are passing through the proximal convoluted tube is so that they can reabsorb materials that had passed through the glomerulus so that they can reabsorb the materials back and take them back into the bloodstream. So that is now selective reabsorption. So the filtrate is flowing through the tubes. Some of these useful substances, uh, we see that they are going to be absorbed back into the bloodstream. So some of these substances which will, which will be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream include some vitamins, not all vitamins, include some vitamins, include some mineral salts, some amino acids will also be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream, as well as glucose. So glucose will be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream, some amino acids, some vitamins, and some minerals will be absorbed back into the bloodstream into the, uh, by the proximal convoluted tube. Remember, I did not say water is reabsorbed here. Water is not reabsorbed into the, by the proximal convoluted tube. Water is not reabsorbed. It's only glucose, some minerals, some uh, vitamins, and also amino acid will be reabsorbed back, but not water molecules. So these substances, we see that, uh, we see that they are reabsorbed back into the bloodstream by either diffusion or active transport. So it is only these two processes that take place here. Diffusion or either active transport, these are the processes which assist in the reabsorption of these substances back into the bloodstream. So for these cells lining, we see that the cells lining these tubes have numerous mitochondrion, of course, to produce energy for active transport to function. So they are densely packed with the mitochondrion in order to produce energy needed for the process of active transport and reabsorption of these materials back into the bloodstream. So the cells of the tube also have microvilli which also increases the surface area for reabsorption. So the proximal convoluted tube, these cells inside the proximal convoluted tube, they are densely much lined with uh, microvilli, whereby these microvilli also assist in reabsorption of substances back into the bloodstream. So apart from that, we see that this proximal convoluted tube is also densely coiled because as you can see, it is highly coiled. Why is the proximal convoluted tube coiled? Just the same, same way we discussed this in Form 1 for the coiling of the ileum. It's exactly the same thing. So the tube is highly coiled which reduces the speed of the glomerular filtrate as it is passing through the proximal convoluted tube. So as the speed of the glomerular filtrate will be reduced, this will mean that maximum reabsorption of materials inside will take place. So that is the main reason as to why it is very much coiled. It is coiled to reduce the speed of the glomerular filtrate inside so that more time will be given for maximum reabsorption of materials back into the bloodstream. So that is exactly what is going to happen here. So apart from that, we see that the tube is also well supplied with blood capillaries. What we can see. So the tube is also well supplied with blood capillaries. Why is it well supplied with blood capillaries? So it is well supplied with blood capillaries for maximum transportation of the absorbed materials back into the bloodstream. So that is the reason why it is densely supplied with blood capillaries. So that these blood capillaries are going to take all the reabsorbed materials and take them back into the bloodstream and into the body circulation. So after the proximal convoluted tube, we now go now to the, the loop of Henol. So the descending loop of Henol. You can still just call them the loop of Henol. There's no need of saying descending, ascending. They are still the loop of Henol. But in the future, we'll see there are functions of the descending, there are functions of the ascending. But in this case, we'll just call it the loop. So after now, the proximal convoluted, we see that uh, the glomerular filtered or the fluid now will now go to the loop of Henol. 
So in the loop of phenol, we see that most water molecules are going to be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream by osmosis. So remember, in the loop of phenol, this is now where reabsorption of water begins to take place. So reabsorption of water in the loop of phenol takes place through, um, takes place through the process of osmosis. So through the process, process of osmosis, reabsorption of water is going to take place. Also here in the loop of phenol, we see that reabsorption of sodium ions is going to take place through uh, the process. Okay, reabsorption of sodium ions is going to take place. So sodium salt reabsorption is mainly regulated by aldosterone hormone. So in the loop of phenol, remember, there is aldosterone hormone which has been pumped by the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland of the brain, this part of the brain which is called pituitary gland, is the master endocrine gland in the body. What do we mean by saying master endocrine gland? Endocrine means hormone. Master endocrine means that pituitary gland of the brain, this is the part of the brain which produces all the hormones in the body. So all the hormones in the body are produced by this small thing in the brain, which is called pituitary gland. So when the filtrate reaches the loop of phenol, the pituitary gland produces aldosterone hormone. This aldosterone hormone is responsible for the reabsorption of sodium ions back into the bloodstream. That's the function of the aldosterone hormone, reabsorption of sodium ions back into the bloodstream. So after that, uh, more reabsorption of water continues to take place in the, in the loop of phenol. So after that, after water has been reabsorbed, we see that the filtrate now goes to the distal convoluted tube. So here in the distal convoluted tube, we see that uh, the pituitary gland also releases antidiuretic hormone. Remember, in the loop of phenol, we have aldosterone hormone for reabsorption of sodium. In the distal convoluted tube, now we have antidiuretic hormone, which is now responsible for the absorption of more water molecules. So, the absorption of water molecules in the distal convoluted tube is controlled by antidiuretic hormone. So, more water molecules are reabsorbed into the distal by this hormone, which is called the antidiuretic hormone. So, this hormone, again, remember, it is secreted by that part of the brain which is called the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland is the master endocrine gland. Master endocrine gland means that this is the gland which basically produces all the hormones in the body. So this hormone is also released by the pituitary gland of the brain. It, its action is taken place in the distal convoluted tube whereby it facilitates reabsorption of more water back into the bloodstream so don't forget that so uh, with that we can also say that excess water and you and urea so excess water urea and salts form now the urine so after all this thing has now taken place so the excess water that w was not reabsorbed excess water urea and salts they now form the urine which is now passed to the pelvis so remember we say that we have the pelvis so from the medulla then the collecting duct, then this urea is now collected at the pelvis. So from the pelvis, the urea will now move down through the ureter and into the urinary bladder. So it will move down from the ureter and into the urinary bladder. So from the urinary bladder, the urine is now going to move from the bladder through the urethra and to the opening environment and be released to the opening environment rather through the process of excretion. So that is exactly how it happens. So the nephrons, they make that urine. After making that urine, they take this urine and pass it through the medulla, collecting duct, and then to the pelvis. Now in the pelvis, through the ureter, the urine is taken from the pelvis and into the urinary bladder through the ureter. From the bladder, the urine moves out of the body through the ureter in a process called excretion. So that is exactly how it happens so that urine is formed and then one uh, excretes urine through the different organs of the male or the female that we have. Biology.